Thank you, Delay, for being here again to the Dario Mambo Show. We had you on before, but I wanted to bring you back on because I had a series of questions I didn't get a chance to ask. Um, I'm prepared this time. I got a series of questions here. We'll go one by one, and we'll just, uh, we'll just go with that. Okay, great. Thank you. It's good to be back. Again, always speaking with you is great. Nice. I, th I think you're an impressive agent, and so I'm thank just you. glad to be here. So thank you so much for so, having me. So uh, a little summary, like what is it? who are you and what is it you do again? Um, so my name is Delilah Walter. Mm -hmm. um, I have a firm, Walter Law. Walter um, Law. Our specialty, of course, is going to be real estate law. Um, so we work in pre-litigation and litigation matters um, in that realm. Um, we also do wills and trusts. We do probates, mm -hmm. guardianships. And then, of course, LOC entities. Wow. So, in short, a real estate lawyer. Correct. A lawyer for your real estate needs. That's correct. There we go. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, great, because I have some questions related to real estate industry for a lawyer. Okay. All right. Question number one is, um, how would you explain, as a lawyer, what a buyer's representation agreement is? Okay. So, a lot of times, people do get confused mm -hmm. about what they that is. I think they don't realize how serious it is. Um, so for a buyer's mm. represent, re, a representation mm. on the buyer side um, mm. is an actual contractual agreement. You are binding yourself to a real estate agent to mm. find you a home and for you to work with them through that process. So it's an agreement between a uh, client and a buyer uh, agent. Right, correct. Mm. So this is an agent and their client's um, contractual agreement mm. to stay together through the process. In there, what buyers should be paying attention mm. to is how long that buyer's representation is as well. Mm, that's one thing to focus on. Right, mm. correct. Uh, a lot of times they think it's you know a one month or two month or and sometimes mm. there's an eighteen month um, time frame in mm. there that they're locked into that agent in order to get mm. and buy or purchase a home and get that done. So let's say someone's in a representation agreement with a buyer agent with, an, with a real estate agent okay. and let's say the buyer has a bad experience after a while after two months like they really don't want to work with this person and, and they have like a family friend or another uh, another uh, resource of an agent that wants to kind of help them continue uh, shopping for a home what risk does that buyer have if they want to change agents during the contract period Right, or so they period. they would at that point be breaching contract. Um, breaching con and what risk do they have? What's the so it doesn't get rid of the fact that the agent representing them during that period has the ability to gain commission mm. um, off of that purchase. So does they that mean that the buyer has to pay that agent? So essentially, they're still going to get commission. However, commission is mm. is is divided up in mm. the transaction. Mm. Um, so there is this. A belief that mm. if I just go with someone else during this contractual agreement, then that and that person finds me a home. Well, they're under contract with the original agent, so the yeah. original agent gets the commission um, mm. on that deal. Right? Wow! So if a buyer has a bad relationship with their current agent, finds another agent they feel more comfortable with, they have a still a 12-month period of the contract, and that agent basically working for free. The new agent. Right. In correct. a way. It's very important for new agents yeah. um, to make sure that they understand whether someone is represented. Not only is it unprofessional, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's also a very, um, let's say, it's like it's not a smart thing to do because mm. then you're just working for a client who is already represented nice. by another agent. That does them, gives them no advantage. Got right? it. And so what, what would you recommend, what advice would you recommend for a buyer that's about to get into the buyer's representation agreement with the real estate agent, what should they look out for and what sh how should they protect themselves? I think they should really do a good job of interviewing their agent and mm. making sure they're very happy with that representation before entering into the agreement as nice. well. I also have a strong belief that as buyers, mm. they should not expect an agent to do a ton of work for them, mm -hmm. take them to 12 houses to go mm. see for buy unless they're in a, in a contractual agreement with them. Mm. Um, one should assume that if they're not in a contractual agreement with a buyer's agent while this buyer is taking them all around to tons of houses, mm -hmm. Um, that at that point, they don't have any loyalty to them, mm -hmm. right? So the, the buyer's agent should also be smart about getting under contract before they so put in So it's important for a real estate agent to also have this agreement with the buyer, potential right. buyer. If not, there's no loyalty there. Right. They're and not contractually, obligated. right? Contractually. Yes. Mm. And, and you should, and, and I think agents need to um, be careful with this because mm -hmm. a lot of times um, you'll, you'll see a lot of agents get burned. 
yeah. right? And this could be friends, family, yeah. people they know, colleagues, and things nice. like that, because they, they being friendly, they right. will go and take them to a ton of houses, only to find that they've met a real estate agent on day 30 and contracted with that one, mm. right? And then, yeah, yeah cause you issues, Man. right? Um, now, there can be, and we won't get into that here, you know, there can be some argument about mm. pro procuring cause. Right. Um, of the protection the, period. Right. Yeah. Of the um, of connecting that buyer to that property mm. and things like that. But mm -hmm. it gets it gets much harder when there's no contract in place. Right. To get them there. Right? Gotcha. Well, thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Another question is this for for a buyer, right? From a real estate lawyer's perspective, what is the biggest risk a buyer has in making an offer on a house? So if I were to pull back and take it out of the real estate transaction realm, mm -hmm. in contract law on a basic offer and acceptance um, concept, in the mm -hmm. legal world, if you just offer something and someone accepts it, especially in writing, it surely helps, yeah. um, then you can actually create a contract that way. Mm -hmm. um, the culture in a buyer-seller um, transaction, mm -hmm. um, like we see all the time, mm -hmm. multiple offers are very common. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times you can. You can offer on several homes, and it really only solidifies when both sides have signed a contract. Mm -hmm. and I think that has a lot to do with just the price is only one aspect of the sale, yeah. right? So you can't expect that a full contract has formed between both parties, both buyer and seller, just yeah. because someone has said, this is the price that I'm, I'm willing to go right. with, and I accept that price. Mm -hmm. There's everything from option period to closing date. To negotiations. Tons yep. of negotiations mm -hmm. to happen still and everyone knows that and mm -hmm. so it becomes more of an open situation in that so even when you make an offer on a house at this price blah 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 doesn't mean that you can't still negotiate it within the within the offer even right. when the offer gets accepted correct mm -hmm. correct so what kind of what kind of risk does a buyer have then in making an offer in a house are they obligated to to pay that right away the the, the cost of the house you know are they are they binded by law you know Right. No, I mean, at that point, you've just made an offer on the property, and then there still needs to be lots of loose ends tied in mm -hmm. at that point. So the buyer doesn't really take a ton of risk other mm -hmm. than that they are mm -hmm. going to get attention. Mm -hmm. um, the seller's agent's going to go, okay, we accept your offer, and then you need to move into the second step. Now, mm -hmm. at that point, if you want to rescind that offer or just say, you know, at this point, we're not interested, or those, those additional negotiated terms just aren't what you want them mm -hmm. to be, um, then you can you can certainly back gotcha. out of that. Mm -hmm. And then last question on this is, uh, what if a buyer makes an offer and the offer never gets accepted? What risk does a buyer have? If a buyer, oh, none at all, none right? At all. Right, mm -hmm. because at that point, then no one's tying you into your offer, mm -hmm. right? So, so an individual can make out make a, make an offer a day in different houses. If those offers never get accepted, they're not legally binded by the offer they submitted. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. correct. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Cool. Next question. This has to do with encroachment. Okay. An encroachment. Can you explain what an encroachment is? Yeah. So it can happen in various ways, but the most popular way that we see in our firm is going to be fence encroachments, mm. right? A lot of times people put up a fence, they might not realize where the boundary line is yeah. between this property and that property. Mm -hmm. And so they may end up what we call encroaching onto their neighbor's property. So um, would you recommend for, let's say, a property owner who has someone else's fence on their property that they can just get a bulldozer and like knock it down? Right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes and no. Right. Yes and no. I mean, it yeah. all depends. We have certainly utilized, mm -hmm. you know, aggressive tactics mm -hmm. um, that may challenge somebody to sue them. Right. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if according to their lawyer's advice, yeah. um, they, they've done all their due diligence and due diligence means a survey of the land. They're mm -hmm. certain you know, that the, mm -hmm. the that the fence is on their property, right. uh, in, within their property line when it shouldn't be, and things like that. Sometimes that may be part of the advice. Is that what I ask you to do right on day one without <laughs> knowing anything about the case? Absolutely not. And then you do have to be careful because whoever has put up that fence, that is also property that belongs to them. So mm. even though 
it is on your property, you know, there's still the idea that they spent money on the materials mm -hmm. of the fence and things like that. So I think sometimes what that does is just open up, despite them mm -hmm. being in the wrong, the other side, I think it might open them up to more liability that we don't need. What's um, a common strategy in, in dealing with these um, claims? What's a common strategy for, as a real estate firm to handle this it, when someone has a fence on someone else's property? So usually what we'll do is make sure that the other side knows first. So mm. a demand letter is is really important to start with mm. in those particular cases because they may have gotten a survey that was wrong. Um, the fence company they hired may have done it inappropriately and it may have been completely innocent. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important right. not to start in an emotional place mm. for a legal issue. I think it's very mm it's very easy to get there yeah. um, because it feels so personal. Yeah. How dare they put a fence yeah. on my property, <laughs> I right? <buy> it, yeah. <laughs> I am angry. Um, but sometimes there are real mm. reasons why the neighbor may not have realized right. that it is where it is. And it could be very much the fencing company. It could be that the surveyor made mm. a mistake mm. or there's conflicting surveys and that needs right. to be figured out. Wow. So usually we will first approach the neighbor and tell them, hey, this is our proof. It is showing that your fence is you know, encroaching on my client's property and you need to remove it. Mm -hmm. And then usually we'll give a timeline for that. Yeah. Right? Wow. Um, that's okay. usually the first step on that. And so would you, we see, all, we see this all the time where a client buys a property, a piece of land maybe, and there's uh, another, another person's fence on it, and mm -hmm. then that buyer wants the agent to, you know, send letters, to knock on the door, to, 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 to do the groundwork. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. What's your recommendation on what an agent should and should not do? So it's really important for both the agent and the um, client of mm -hmm. that agent, whether it's the buyer or seller, whoever right. is the one that has engaged the agent, to understand the scope of mm -hmm. what the agent is supposed to be involved with. Mm -hmm. a, an encroachment of a fence is a legal issue. Both agents mm -hmm. and their clients need to understand that their job stops at that point, mm -hmm. right? While the client can sometimes expect more from their agent, mm -hmm. they need to understand that going beyond that scope places mm -hmm. their agent in liability for doing things that they don't have the expertise in. Not just them, the brokerage. And the brokerage, right, absolutely. So maybe it's an agent, a real estate agent's responsibility to educate their client on what they can and cannot do. Right, mm. yes. I think it's very important at the engagement level, and I think it, we take it back to that, yeah. that um, it, engagement agree, agreement right. between the client and the real estate agent. Mm -hmm. At that point, it needs to be made very clear that they are simply helping them through the sales process, but not providing any legal advice. Mm. Um, I think what happens is clients get really attached as well to their agent. Um, and so they want to continue that relationship in things outside of the scope mm. of that representation. It might be after the buy sell is complete and it's closed already. Yeah. Um, and, and the agent may want to help. I, yeah. I think it's natural, right. especially for good agents to want to right. go beyond the right. scope because that's them being there for right. them. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it does well for the clients just to recommend them to a real estate agent and tell them these, this, this is who you need to go with. Just go with them. And then they will walk you through this process or give you your options at that point. So an yeah. agent should recommend a lawyer. Right. Correct. An agent should recommend you. Right. <laughs> a real estate lawyer who yes. specializes in real estate. Gotcha. Especially, yeah. And that's what's important, too. I think agents should always have a real estate a, a lawyer in their back pocket. Yeah. Um, somebody they know that they can trust to take care right. of their clients because mm -hmm. whoever they hire as a, or refer as a real estate mm -hmm. lawyer to their clients is an extension of them in their business. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so do you ever do you have any kind of uh, going off topic, but do you yes. ever have any uh, retainers with brokerage, real estate brokerages? Yeah, so there are there are attorneys. We don't, mm. um, but there are attorneys who work for the brokerages specifically mm. um, in protecting the agents right. um, through the process. Yeah, a lot right. of time the brokers or the managing brokers are, are the ones that help kind of mitigate the liabilities that the agents get into, you know? They do. They do. That's they like do. kind of their job. Yeah. Um, but let's, let's keep having that conversation about representation, what a lawyer, a real estate lawyer can do, because in, in this city, we have a lot of growth. Uh, and we have a lot of need for new houses. 
And a lot of those new houses are being developed by companies that develop acres of lands of new houses. Right. And then what you find is that um, home buyers are having getting to contracts with these builders who then in turn make their own contracts, have their own lending, and, w- and could, could, potentially, could potentially get into what's called steering, where they try to entice these buyers to only use their products, their lender, you know. Right, right. Um, what's your experience in this industry? A whole lot. Um, yeah. So one of the most important things for um, buyers to understand when it comes to new build is 99.9% of the time, they're drafting that contract on the builder side. Right. right. So if the buyer gets into a contract with the builder, it protects the builder. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So what they need to make sure of is that a real estate lawyer goes and reads those contracts. We do that all the time mm-hmm. just to make sure that when they go into the transaction, they understand what they're getting into. So every into. builder has a different contract? They do. So it'd be one from Lennar, uh, D.R. Horton, Dean uh uh, David Weekly, all these like ha- would have a different. They do. Oh man! Interestingly, they're different. Yeah. But just as dangerous. Yeah. The same in that sense, mm, right? Because right. they all have their own attorneys that draft up right. what they think is the best protections for their client, and so they're going to be different. Mm-hmm. Um, but on a on a basic level, they are all going to protect the builder and very much not protect right. the um, buyer. Right. And a lot of the clauses that we see in there mm. are very scary things. Let's mm. go through those real quick. Sure. Okay. Yeah. The builder many times will draft in a clause that mm. doesn't give them a definite date of completion. Mm-hmm. You saw that a lot during 2020. You yeah. saw that a lot during COVID right. because they were afraid of the prices, right, of right. lumber and things like that. Right. And so they will build that in there. Well, mm. we can just kind of finish when we need to. If more time is needed, then we will do this. It's not a breach of contract. Right. You know. And in addition to that, they will add in termination clauses. Mm-hmm. It says, well, if the if um, the cost of lumber and such is, or if, if it's it's financially unfeasible for us to build this house, we can terminate mm. this contract at any point. In the meantime, your buyer is spending money right. on a place to live while they're waiting for the build to finish. They, they paid for upgrades. They've paid for upgrades. But they have to pay in advance. They've paid earnest money that's locked in mm-hmm. at that point, right? Ever and while the while the builder can just go ahead and terminate um, when they feel like it, yeah. right? Um, and a lot of times, too, they will build in um, no remedies mm-hmm. for the uh, buyer. Yeah, They will slash DTPA sometimes appropriately or inappropriately. So mm. there's a certain clause that needs to be in there to properly yeah. slash the DTPA, which is misrepresentation. What's a DTPA? So that's called the Deceptive Trade Practices mm. Act. Um, yeah. which is our misrepresentation statute here in Texas yeah. that's really scary, um, that if something is done intentionally, then mm. the buyer can get trouble damages. Right. So smartly so, oh, the builders will slash that, and there's a certain clause you have to put in to actually adequately do that. Yeah. Um, and there's some requirements to actually be able to waive DTPA. Very so by, the, if, by waiving or slashing, that means they can... They can do that. Right. That means that it gets rid of probably the most powerful statutory remedy oh. for a buyer as against a builder. And it, it's in a misbehaves. contract. It's hidden in the contract and you can find it. It's, it's, it's Well, if it's hidden, then yeah. it's not done appropriately. So it takes me back to what the uh. requirements are for waiving a DTPA in a contract are high. There, It has to be a certain font. It has to be bolded. A lawyer has to be involved. So mm. there's a lot of requirements to waive that DTPA wow. um, claim. But they will still try, and some of them are better at others in doing it appropriately. So it's still dangerous when you see any kind of waiver in there for what what's mm-hmm. called the DTPA is what we call it acronym wise, right, um, right? Because that's that's the that's them getting rid of a very very heavy. Um, statutory right for the buyer. So these are just some of Sheesh. things um, yeah. that I see builders do. Um, a can lot I of times... You, can I give you a scenario? You tell me if yes. this is uh, likely to be true or not true. Okay. Uh, client gets... A uh, buyer gets into a contract with a new build and pays the funds for the upgrades and everything. And they, and they give them a projected time of when the house will be done. And then interest rates are so good at that time that the client can easily afford it, right? Uh, a year later, house is not done. Almost getting to two years later, um, interest rates had gone up. And of course, they can't lock in their interest rate until like, they're, I think, 60 days out mm-hmm. of closing. Mm-hmm. 
And so this client is under the, the, the buyer is under the, uh, the other perception that the builder is stalling the, is stalling in order to price out the, the buyer. And because we had so, ch uh, changed the email threads, the pressing them, pressing them, the houses next to them are being built, even though they got in contracts afterwards. So right. um, we had this conversation, you know, and we almost had to get a lawyer involved because of this. Um, but we, we put so much pressure on them that they ended up working out. But would you say that's more likely to be true or not true? Um, true. And I will say especially Ooh. true especially true during COVID. Yeah. What, what the builders were getting into contractual agreements before COVID got crazy. And as everyone knows, when COVID hit, mm. all the supplies and everything got more expensive. The yeah. market blew up. Right. So builders were starting to see dollar signs. Yeah. And so if they could delay the build either to, you know, scram the buyer out to make mm -hmm. them want to terminate. It's a, they might be, the buyer may even do it voluntarily. I saw yeah. that a lot too. Yeah, a lot of them just like, the buyer goes, well, it's been two years now. I need a place to live. I can't, you know. So they would put them into these situations. Mm. And, of course, the contract, you know, was yeah. perfect for it. And so the buyer was capable of, of terminating yeah. at that point. And it, you know, helped the builder. So you saw, you would you would agree that that, that was a strategy. That, that was a thing, yes. Man, that's kind of scary. Yeah, it was, it was really, really ugly. And it was horrible because, you know, this client, waited almost two years right you know right. spent a lot of money a lot of time a lot of energy a lot of mental distress of mm -hmm. of thinking about this over and over and over again for like 24 months right oh right. man and it's it's sometimes the in the builder would on purpose right do this because that means that if that con contract failed um and was terminated then it allows them to go and get under contract for a higher price. So that was right. the biggest mission right. for builders at the time. Mm. Um, and we see a little bit of it still now, but the market is changing. Um, so the, the, the right. relationship between the builder and buyers are a little different right. these days. Um, but at that time, and we may still see some remnants of it right. here and there, um, that's what their main goal was. It was probably less expensive for the builder mm. at that time to breach their contract if it is mm. even breachable. Like I said, right. a lot of times there are open clauses on finish dates. Right. Right. Um, it was less expensive for them to just do the one remedy that's in the contract, which are many times just return the earnest money. Yeah. Right. Which is what fifty to sixty thousand yeah. sometimes, and hopefully they don't say anything. And then yeah. yeah, and then but they may have even gotten rid of their remedies. Right. The the buyer, like right. I said, those contracts don't even give the buyer the opportunity to get any other real remedies or damages. Mm. You can you can argue those things, and maybe there's a chance right to win that in court. Yeah. Um, but they've just lost two years of time. Right. They're getting their fifty or sixty thousand dollars back, Dang. and then are ready to walk away, and are probably not looking to spend any more litigation funds right. on the thing that already delayed them yeah. and cost them a lot of money right. already. And builders are relying on that. Um, and so it's mm. less expensive for them to just breach or not breach, as I mentioned earlier, right. and terminate um, or cause a termination, right? I saw both yeah. sides. Yeah. Um, so that then they can put it on the market for $200,000 more. Well, right. And that's what it... I think what was happening because you know, these buyers got in a contract at a, such a great price, and within two years, the the appraisal value was already like almost not double, but fifty percent. Yeah. More. Yes. Well, we can go all day on this. Seems like you have a lot of experience, and it's kind of scary to know that you know these things were really happening because we were out in the field doing this. But you know, I would give the benefit of the doubt to the builders. But hearing it from you sounds like you know it was very common. Right. And, and now I think I think people need to realize when they're going for a new build home, they need to get their contract looked at. Yeah. So that's that's what you would recommend. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Let's let's talk about um, an issue that uh, a lot of homeowners in San Antonio may or may not know. And these are people who have second homes, investment homes, rental homes. Right. Um, would you recommend a landlord to put their property that they're not living in their secondary home, investment home, in the LLC rather than their own name? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. what happens when you have a tenant, um, mm -hmm. which is typically what you see, they're either going to be Airbnbs, mm -hmm. um, some investors are big on Airbnbs, yeah. and some are on the long-term rental front, right? No matter what, you have people in your house, right. and you have contractual agreements with those people. Mm -hmm. And so your possibility or the likelihood of you getting sued is a little higher than mm -hmm. your homestead because you don't have strangers in your house all the yeah. time, <laughs> right? Um, right? You're not likely to sue yourself while you're in the shower and you sleep, yeah, right? right. Um, that's just a funny example. 
example. But I, you know, anything can happen between either those contractual relationships or, you know, something can happen that mm. the tenant does um, or Airbnb short term renter does mm. that causes damage to your property. Right. right. Or something happens to them and then they want to sue you, which is what we're really talking about right. here. When they want to sue you. The tenant suing the landlord. Right. Mm. And what you don't want them to be able to sue you for is personally. Because then they're able to reach your personal assets. Anything that you own under your name mm -hmm. is all free game. When they sue you personally and they get a judgment, then mm. collection attorneys, we don't do collections, but yeah. there are attorneys that specifically work on collections. Uh -huh. um, when they go and do collections of, of judgments, they can tap into those assets. Wow. So you want an LLC because it is just what it is. It limits liability, limit, limited liability company to cause you to have sort of a protective layer over that business or that home that is under the LLC. How, how would a landlord go ahead go about doing that? Just make an LLC and then, and then what? So what we usually do is we'll create the LLC mm -hmm. entity. So the Secretary of State has to, you Unlimited. know, then get it registered. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, we draft governing documents that go with that. Mm -hmm. Then we do a deed that places the property from your personal name into the LLC entity. Mm -hmm. And that's how it ends up covered mm -hmm. by the LLC. Of course, if you have a separate business, like a property management business that's managing them or, mm -hmm. you know, just a landlord right. business of any sort um, that enters into the contracts, um, that's smart, too, because you're going to want to make sure that is an LLC as well. Mm -hmm. Because what, oh, what good is your house, the house, right, your investment property being an LLC if you're going under contract under your personal name? Right. And I see that pretty often. And I go, we have to think about who is entering into the contract, because if that contract is breached and it's a contractual mm -hmm. breach, right. Right. then they're going to go for whoever they entered into the agreement with. Right. So even though you have your house in the LOC, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that same LOC is the one that's entering into contracts or oh, create a second LOC for your property management co company or your landlord company. Right. So what if, so you have an LOC and the house, how do you put the house under the LOC by doing the, the deed? The deed. Yes. And what deed options does, do people have? So there's, there's several different types of deeds, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we can go into deeds for a bit here. Sure. Um, so there's a special warranty deed, mm -hmm. a general warranty deed, right? And then the ever so popular <laughs> quick claim quick deed. Claim. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with that one. What's, yeah. what's a quick claim deed? Okay. So a quick claim deed just essentially says, I don't have ownership of this property anymore. And I'm, you know, and, and it has the grantor yeah. and the grantee part of it. Yeah. So it looks very much like a legitimate deed. But many times what a quick claim deed is missing is the granting, give, conveying language. Mm. And we can get into this more because it's a, a big debate between real estate attorneys all the time is, right. you know, and it's sometimes hard to explain. So I won't get into it a ton here. Right. But what everyone needs to know is that a quick claim deed, let's just mm. put that in everyone's minds. A quick claim deed is not a real deed. It's not a real deed. It's not a real deed in Texas. In Texas, um, okay. Now, there may be other states that, and I notice other states do religiously use yeah. quick claim deeds. But here it's very different. So the way the state recognizes it is not a, is not a real deed. So what is a real deed? So a real deed actually has the conveying language in it. It's a mm. giving, granting, conveying, and it's specific language. Oh, so it uses that language. The correct language uh, that uh, actually uh, moves the ownership of the property from one person to mm. the next person, right? Um, so oftentimes we hear, and agents have to be careful with this too, they'll say, all you just need is a quick claim deed. I mean, that's almost like the exact statement we get in the office. Right. Oh, my agent told me I just need a quick claim deed right. to do this, you know, whatever. And so, you know, um, we need to stay away from that. Yeah. We need to stay away from that. And that's one of the first things my paralegal will tell folks mm. um, and anyone who calls is like, you don't want a quick claim deed. It's going to be either a special warranty deed or a general warranty deed. OK, a special warranty deed is mm. one that says, I promise that I own the property and it's kind of a one stepper. You're mm. just you're just you're just saying, I promise that I have an interest in the property yeah. and I'm warranting that. So you can sue on the contents of a deed according to that warranty. Mm. OK, 
a general warranty deed is larger. It's saying not only am I promising that I own that, but like everyone behind me oh. also owned it too. So I'm warranting that and mm. promising you that that's the case. So if someone has a title insurance, right, in, in a strong, a good title policy, that means that they've already gone and done a title search and looked at the liens and verified ownership. Right. And so wouldn't a special warranty be okay because basically they have the documentation that says it's been checked out? Well, it's a risk that someone just has to determine at that time, mm. right? Special warranty deeds are used pretty often because mm. a lot of times on a liability basis, the seller doesn't want to take the risk um, of promising anything themselves. So that's the difference. Like promising like other people who own the property? Before them, oh. right. So there are two different things. So there's your title policy, which the insurance company for the title company is saying, I, I'm going to defend you. Yeah. If something goes wrong, we've checked everything and we've done our very best at due diligence here. And let's give you a title commitment to tell you this is what's wrong or needs mm. to be cleared. And we cleared all those things. And now we're going to give you insurance, a policy at yeah. the end. And it's going to say, hey, if something goes wrong here, we're going to defend you. And they have their own lawyers. And, and sometimes I'm I'm litigating against these lawyers yeah. um, because something went wrong yeah. um, with title. And so those lawyers would then defend them, right? Mm. So that's what that does. The deed is, is its own promise um, by the seller itself mm. inside the deed saying, I promise that I own this, whether it's specialty, um, a special warranty deed, or I promise that everyone behind mm. me. And so that on is, is its own document that someone can sue over. I see. Right? So if someone wanted to do a general warranty, like how, what's the turnaround time between starting that process and then having that reflect on the county? Oh, okay. So there is somewhat of a delay there mm. in um, drafting them is pretty quick for mm. our office. Um, and then we record them as soon as they execute them. We always have the have to have the original in the office. Mm -hmm. um, and then we record it in the property records. Okay. Mm -hmm. The property records has access online through yeah. electronic means, mm -hmm. and you won't always see that right away. It takes it a while to be able right. to search, to make it searchable, because the clerks are still putting them into the system and things mm -hmm. like that. Where a lot of people um, think they will see that deed or that change right away is the appraisal district and the tax assessor's office. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand right, right. that's county right government and so they have tons of new deeds that yeah. kind of come in and get reported to them yeah. on a consistent basis right so you may not see the change in ownership in those records right for six months sometimes yeah. to a year because they're still processing those things right so what i would recommend is if someone's trying to get that change right away is that they take that deed the recorded deed and go and hand it to them Go, mm. we need to change ownership here and hand it to, to the, the county. The county, right. Mm. And it, it, there's two offices. There's the appraisal district and yeah. the tax assessor's office. Mm. So I would take them to both if you want them to immediately be reflected oh, okay. in the system. So the yeah. same place you go get your car registration every every year? Is I don't know that car registration is in the same place. Because uh, that it's a tax assessor, right? It's a tax Rest, assessor. Resti, yeah. What's his name? Um, you Al yes. Albert Uresti? Yes. Yeah, so that's yes. where you go to get your car registration. Okay, well, my husband takes mine. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's in the same place, right? right. If that's it's, if that's Albert Uresti's yeah. office, then that's correct. Yeah. Um, that one and then the appraisal district. Oh, as okay. Well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so we gone through some deed questions. Um, we went to some of the title review, um, real quick, you know, why is it important for a home buyer to do a title review on the property? So whenever, what does that mean? Well, okay. So there's different mm. types of purchases. There's two types. Sometimes the investors, their most popular, yeah. um, transaction does not have title insurance, um, mm. because they're pretty loose and quick, yeah. um, with sometimes their business. Right. Um, and that's okay. It's yeah. just a risk that they take. Um, but sometimes you can opt not to have title insurance. But what you're doing when you do mm. that is you're accepting that if you didn't do your research or get somebody to research it, right, right. then you could be getting a property that's upside down and you don't know it. Mm. Because there could be a lien on there that is 
worth more than the value of the property itself. Oh, man. Right? <laughs> so anytime like you buy... Like, what would buy, be an example of that? So child support liens, um, can, judgment so liens. So someone can have child support of balance that's worth more than the house? Right. Yes. Wow. I mean, this is 18 years of a child's life. Right, so. right. <laughs> Sheesh. Right? Um, so if some of them who've not paid at all, right? right. IRS liens can be large right. um, as well. Um, tax lending liens, yeah. um, which are pretty powerful liens. Mm-hmm. Um, judgment liens, you know, who knows? They could have a half a million dollar judgment against them, and it's got a lien on the house oh, that basically wow. says when you sell this, you're supposed to pay us. Pay with the asset. Right. Wow. So when you don't make sure those things are cleared, one, when you don't know they exist, and two, right. when you don't make sure they're cleared at the sale of the property, you are basically voluntarily buying it subject to, and that's the, mm. the term we use, subject to all of the liens on the property. Right. If you don't do a title If you don't do a title, title search or have a title insurance company give mm. you a title commitment. Wow, so it's important. So it's very important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very important. Save 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 the time, save the energy. Yes, yes. Nice. Um all right. Well, um I think that's all the questions for right now. Is there anything that you feel that is important for real estate professionals because you know that's the industry i work in Mm -hmm. that we need to know about um coming from the perspective of a real estate lawyer um anything off the top of your head well i think that it's important for agents to feel comfortable in not being comfortable Mm. with all of the questions their clients may ask Mm. that may be in the legal realm yeah right so how do you know when how do you know when someone's a a client's asking a, a real estate agent some questions and then What's a good rule, rule of thumb? Like, oh, this might be a question for a lawyer, not me. So whenever it's something you don't know about, one, mm. because most of the time, you know, agents are pretty good about knowing about the sales transaction part of things. Yeah. Um, but when clients start asking about contracts mm. and this went wrong, what do I do? Mm-hmm. Um, or what are our options? What are our legal options mm-hmm. here? Or things like what happens if we don't do this, right? right. AKA, we'd like to breach the contract. Right. What, what will happen? And that me? happens a lot because, yeah. uh, you know, a real estate agent usually helps a buyer kind of fill out the contract. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, clarify this are agents, real estate agents, supposed to explain or read out the contract to the buyers? No. No, right? No. And so whenever a buyer, uh, or even a setter says, ask questions. Well, what about paragraph two? What does this mean? Or um, in paragraph eleven, special provisions. You know, this is that. Like, what does that mean? You know, like a real estate agent should what? Um, should tell them I can't interpret contractual clauses for you. Mm. I can tell you what it says and I can read it to you, mm. um, but only a real estate lawyer can actually interpret clauses for you and mm. the ramifications of those clauses. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, mm. when, so going back to the question, whenever, whenever you, you get a question, you're not sure about. You should just refer it out. Right. Mm. Correct. Correct. And I think agents want to do well for their clients. Yeah, right. And it's it's a hard, and that's why I think it's important to say it out loud, um, because I think agents having or trying to be helpful, you want to mm. offer as much services as your brain and your training can give them. Right. Um, naturally, right? Um, yeah. But even as attorneys, we also have niches. Mm -hmm. Mine is real estate. Mm -hmm. But if someone came to me and asked me about their divorce, Mm the very first thing I will say is that is not my my realm of law. I'm a real estate attorney. I can tell you everything about transactions and other things related. Yeah, (laughs) contracts and real estate and things like that. But I can't talk to you about child custody. Uh, Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we'll end it with this. Like, let's say someone's watching this and wants to learn to understand how to become a real estate lawyer. Like what are some of the things that you, what are some of the educational requirements you need and some of the job experience you need and but also what's the character uh, requirements you need right. to be a lawyer? So um, one of the things they don't teach you mm. in, um, in law school is business. Right. Right. Um, and so it's important to sort of on your own uh, read books on business Um, take courses on business so Mm. you understand just how it works in general Mm -hmm. especially if you're looking to go solo or to start your own firm like Mm -hmm. I have yeah Um, but um, of course you need your JD of course you need to get through the bar um, as well but Mm -hmm. if they're law students the the best thing to do in real estate law it is such a practice area and what Mm. I mean by that is there's not 
there are books. There's pro the property code. That's one source, right? Mm -hmm. There are litigation guides that talk about it. Mm -hmm. But the content of real estate is mm. not easily self-learned. Yeah. So that's why we have interns in our office mm -hmm. because I'm a huge advocate for education. But if someone is trying to get into real estate law, the best thing for you to do is find a real estate lawyer mm. and go to their office and try to become an intern for them because mm. real estate law in practice is not like much other laws yeah. in which you can just read a book and sort of you master need to get your hands that way. Dirty. You gotta get in there you gotta and be in the field. You right, gotta, talk about it. Yeah. Right. And how long have you been in this industry? Um, so seven years at this point. And right. I'm sure you, you learn something new every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, they always say that real estate law is a mile wide and an inch deep. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what they mean by yeah. that is there are so many types of real estate law, and yeah. we do many of them. But there's so much to master mm. in all of that. Yeah. Sometimes in real estate, we also have a mixture of probate and right. intestate law. Mm. Grandmother died. This mm. house has been sitting there for 20 years. We never probated her estate. Who owns it now? Yeah. Right. Wow. That's all understanding intestate law as well. So mm. it's a mixture of laws, too. So you have to master a lot of things. And also be really good problem solver. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I awesome. think so. Well, thank you, Delay, for being here. I think yes. uh, we're good for today. Thank Great. you for coming in. Thank and you I for hope having me. People who are watching this get a lot of value coming from the perspective of a real estate lawyer. How right. awesome is that? Yeah, thank you. Thank I'm you. glad to share. Thank you. Until next time. Till next time. <laughs> and done. <laughs>